It's a bright, breezy Sunday morning in December. Walt Disney sits on a bench in Griffith Park, near his home and studio in Burbank, California. As with most Sundays, Walt dropped his daughters off at church this morning. He never goes himself. And after picking them up from service, drove them to the park to ride the carousel. While they play, waving to their father as they spin past, Walt is distracted. This bench is hard and uncomfortable, and he wishes he could join them, playing with his daughters rather than being a passive voyeur to their fun. He distracts himself by daydreaming of a place where children and adults can play, where the family as a whole can enjoy themselves. The place Walt imagines bears a strong resemblance to a place from his early childhood. Walt's parents moved to Chicago so his father could work the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, the famous White City. There's a file on the exposition in the theme park I've ancillary warehouse, if anyone's interested. It was there, eight years later, that Walt was born. But 1901 Chicago was congested, crime-ridden, and covered in the colloidal miasma of industry. It was no place for children. Which is why Walt's father, Elias, moved the family to Marceline, Missouri when Walt was four. The town of Marceline was picturesque and stereotypical, in a quaint way, of a small Midwestern town. At its center, dirt roads surrounded Ripley Square, a park with a gazebo for bands, a long pond, and a cannon statue on a plinth with little decorative cannonballs beside it. Along the main boulevard bordering the square, Kansas Avenue, stood a selection of buildings torn from a Mark Twain novel. Dry goods, hardware, farm supply, jewelry, and department stores, a tavern, barber shop, meat market, ice company, and a creamery. The Disney farm, located just outside of town, was equally archetypical, with livestock, horses, foxes, wild game, and other animals. The place had apples, plums, peaches, grapes, and berries, and the yard was full of trees, willow, mock orange, silver maple, cedar, lilac, and dogwood. A family member likened the yard's natural beauty to a park. Now, Walt is sitting in a real park, watching his daughters go round and round as he watches on. He turned 40 just two days ago on Friday, and he's accomplished more already than most men do in their entire lives. He's had many failures, but he's always bounced back. He started his studio in his 20s, only to go bankrupt and move to Los Angeles. He created an American icon, Mickey Mouse, only to have the character fall out of popularity. His current studio, Walt Disney Productions, almost went bankrupt last year, saved only by taking the company public. He's one of the most successful men in America, but he's dreaming of a place that reminds him of his youth. For a mere five years, Walt lived in this American Eden, a rustic, turn-of-the-century, Midwestern farm aesthetic that he would return to again and again later in life. By the time Walt was nine and his family moved away, Marceline had automobiles, paved roads, and its own electric power plant. The Disneys moved to Kansas City, Missouri, where Elias bought a newspaper route. Walt helped deliver the papers, putting in hours of hard work to feed the family. Now, as an adult, he still wakes from nightmares about facing his father's anger because the papers are late or lost or misdelivered. One of Walt's escapes back in Kansas City was Electric Park, an amusement park near the family house with a train, carousel, and thousands of lights illuminating it at night. After dark, he and a friend, also named Walt, would sneak in under the fence to walk around. 
Disney told his friend that one day he would own his own amusement park. His park would have a carousel, just like the one from the electric park of his childhood, like the one he's sitting beside now, listening to the organ play Five Foot Two, Eyes of Blue. Has anybody seen my girl? At the Snow White premiere several years ago, where a small replica of the dwarves' house was erected near the theater, he told a friend he wanted to build a park of similar buildings, all sized for children. This idea has grown over the last couple years and become more crystallized. The past two years have been rough on Walt, though. Pinocchio underperformed at the box office, partially due to the new war in Europe. After years of resisting the idea, Walt only agreed to take the company public to save it. Three days after the initial offering in April, he left on an impulsive trip to New York with Lillian, his wife, and studio executive producer Ben Sharpstein and his wife, ostensibly for a demonstration of stereophonic sound at Carnegie Hall. On the way back, however, they visited Henry Ford's museum and Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. Greenfield Village is a collection of historic buildings and recreations arranged in themed districts, telling the living history of the United States, with period actors that never break character. Walt was entranced. It featured reproductions of Colonial Philadelphia, an Edison exhibition, a main street like the one of Walt's Marceline childhood, a small, circular lake with an island in its center, and of course, a carousel with organ music. During the return train ride to LA, Walt talked with Ben Sharpstein about using the lot on Riverside Drive, next to the studio, to create something like Ford's Greenfield Village. He wants to set up a series of displays on the land, quote, just something to show people who wanted to visit the Disney studio. For years, he's been toying with the idea of a studio tour, but Walt has doubts. He doesn't think anyone wants to see a bunch of animators hunched over desks, scribbling for hours on end. He wants to entertain the people that visit the studio, to give them, quote, a place where the whole family can have fun. In November last year, Disney released Fantasia, to negative critical response and another poor box office showing. Though Walt and his studio managed to avoid the Great Depression's effects for the past decade, the lack of income on two consecutive films pushed them to the brink. The financial pressures at the studio, never Walt's strong suit, had been mounting ever since, and now there were shareholders to consider. Salaries were cut, animators were resentful. Back in May of this year, the tensions boiled over, and the animators went on strike. Meanwhile, the studio premiered an anthology of cartoon shorts, The Reluctant Dragon, in early June. The film tied the shorts together with a fictionalized tour of the studio by the author of the children's book, The Reluctant Dragon, who was looking to have Walt turn the book into a cartoon, only to find out he already had. This was a small way to test the waters, to gauge interest in Disney studio tours. Of course, the striking animators picketed the premiere of The Reluctant Dragon, and the film went on to net less than $400,000. This seemed to confirm Walt's concern that no one really wanted a tour of the studios to watch chain-smoking old men sketching the same thing over and over. From letters he received over the years, Walt knew children wanted to visit and see where Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Goofy, and Snow White lived. The five-week work stoppage also resulted in even more resentment and bitter feelings between Walt and the animators. Walt left on a government-sponsored Goodwill tour of South America, while the company finalized an agreement with the animators union that did the studio no favors. Despite the strike disrupting work, Disney still released Dumbo in October. Though it was made with less care and attention than the previous features, it was also made with less money. The film got positive reviews, but will take a few years to become profitable. At the same time, the situation in Europe has gotten even worse. The Nazi government in Germany has taken most of the continent, with Great Britain and Russia holding off further advance. In Asia, Japan has taken much of the eastern part of the continent, 
and is now eyeing U.S. and British holdings in the South Pacific. Even now, while Walt was picking up his daughters at Sunday school, the first waves of Japanese attack planes flew over Pearl Harbor. The surprise attack lasted an hour and a half and killed over 2,400 Americans. By the time Walt drives home with the girls, the news is on the radio. Fearing an attack on the U.S. mainland, the government activates all military defenses. Walt receives a call from the studio manager that 500 army troops are already stationed on the studio lot, setting up anti-aircraft guns to defend the nearby Lockheed Aircraft Factory. World War II will sideline almost all of Walt's work. Bambi is supposed to have a preview showing in early December. It will be delayed until February. Walt will take on work from the government, making training films and propaganda. This keeps the studio solvent for the course of the war, though it also means shelving many future projects, like Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, The Wind in the Willows, and of course, Cinderella. The only features the studio will release during the war are Saludos Amigos and The Three Caballeros, anthology films based on his South America trip, and a documentary called Victory Through Air Power, promoting long-range bombing as a strategy to win the war. Disney will not make an animated feature again until years after the war. And despite having mentioned his idea for a park to a few others, Disneyland, as it will be called, must remain one man's dream for at least another seven years. And now, a brief disclaimer on artistic license. So while Walt really did visit the carousel at Griffith Park as a Sunday ritual with his daughters, uh, there's no confirmation that that's what he was doing on December 7th, 1941. He did hear about the Pearl Harbor attack over the radio, uh, but probably not while driving the girls home. Additionally, the Griffith Park carousel may not play five foot two eyes of blue, but it's possible. The organ plays a list of 1500 songs that I can't seem to find a list of anywhere. and. The song is available for that model of Stinson organ that the carousel uses, so if you know the organ plays that song, especially if you've got video of it, we'd love to see it. And of course, let us know your thoughts in the comments down below, and don't forget to do the like, subscribe, and notification thing for more of our stuff. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time in the Theme Parkive.